So one of my patrons asked me an interesting question. He wanted to know if there was anything he could specifically do to improve his melodic phrasing in the solos that he played. Now, obviously, I can't give a specific set of advice to him because I've never seen him play, but there are things that you can generally focus on that will help you, help you develop your melodic phrasing. And that's really what I want to touch on this week. And I also thought I'd talk about general principles rather than specific licks or anything like that. So what I, I thought I'd talk about specifically is mindset, what's going on in my head when I'm playing, when I'm playing a solo, how do I get into the zone if you like. There's uh, phrase construction as well, so what is a melodic phrase. And then I thought I'd talk about the arc of the solo as well, what's going on throughout the solo, especially in an extended solo, what can you do from, from that level, from the big picture point of view. And then finally, I thought I'd give you some homework, give you some listening homework. I'll, I'll give you a solo to listen to and then give you some ideas, some approaches that you can use while you're listening to it. So the mental approach then. So, so there's kind of a trick that you can use to connect with your audience. And it's basically this. We, we as a species have only been playing the guitar for a tiny amount of time. So I'm playing music generally for a relatively small amount of time. But we've been communicating with each other verbally for about 100,000 years. So if you can tap onto that, if you can start to imitate our verbal communication, if you can start to imitate how we sing, you find that you, you'll, uh, your audience will be able to understand what you're playing at a much more primal level, if you like, than if you're just playing a whole load of notes. And that's the trick. That's probably the single most important thing to understand if you want to improve the connection between yourself and your audience. So how do you do that? Well, what I do is that I, I sing the solo in my head. It's, it's an internal thing for me. I don't necessarily vocalize it, but I know a lot of guitarists do. But if you can think of the notes, if you can sing the notes lyrically as you're playing it, you'll find that it helps you as the performer because it'll naturally help your your phrase construction, it'll naturally help you build those melodic lines. But it will also allow your audience to, to understand what you're playing because you're taking advantage of, of a communication mechanism that we've had for many thousands of years. So, so that's the real trick. And I know a lot of guitarists actually do sing out loud when they're playing their music as well. And that has a lot of benefits as well, because you start to understand, you really do know when you're hitting the note that you've got in your head if you're singing out loud. The other value to this, actually, is if you've got some kind of writer's block. You know, if, you, if you're playing a guitar solo and you just can't think of a line, often the best thing to do is to put the guitar down and just sing something in your head or sing something out loud, create a line away from your instrument. And what that does is it stops you using all the same old tired patterns that you've used plenty of times before. And you start creating something brand new just from the music that you're hearing and just from the, the sounds that you're creating in your head. So phrase construction then. If we approach it from the point of view of verbal communication, then a phrase, a musical phrase, is, is really just a sentence. And if you think about it in those terms, if you think about a musical phrase as just being a musical sentence that has some meaning in itself, has a start and a stop point, if you think about saying that sentence out loud or saying that musical phrase out loud, then you naturally need to take a breath at the end of the phrase as you do at the end of every sentence. And that instantly starts to break up the phrases and puts more structure into the music that you're playing as well. So that's really powerful, again, just from the point of view of approaching playing as though you're singing. So what can be really helpful is to, to listen to other instruments, to listen to other performers, not just guitarists. Listen to, to people like sax players who have to take a breath, who have to break their music up into phrases. Listen to how they do it and listen to how they construct these phrases. Similarly, listen to singers as well. Listen to how they create their musical lines, listen to how they vocalize them and listen to how they embellish them, what kinds of uh, 
additional notes and enhancements they put on the phrases that you, they use. So that's, that's really powerful as well. And the other thing to do is to start thinking about phrases in the context of other phrases as well. Think about paragraphs. So when you're creating a phrase, you, you're not just creating one phrase in isolation. You can develop that idea. You can take that idea and turn it into a question and an answer. So you've got two phrases that connected, they're connected musically. And you can actually build whole paragraphs, if you like, that are connected musically, just like this, by creating themes, by developing those themes, by putting a little tension and release in those themes, put a question and an answer, or do a call and response. All of these, all of these ideas are, are ways of sort of creating a phrase and then embellishing it. So you don't have to create new material every time you create a new phrase. So the story or the arc of the solo is really important, especially if it's an extended one as well. You need to think about the journey that you want to go on through the solo, so you're not just playing at the same intensity for the entire solo. And there, there are lots of different journeys, and again, I, I like to take a solo and associate it with real life in some way. Um, there are lots of different structures, lots of different journeys that I, I've experimented with and that have worked for me. Even, even stealing structures from songs, for example, you can create a solo and model it on, on that classic verse, chorus, verse, chorus, middle eight, uh, chorus, end type structure. I've done that successfully and, and basically what you're doing is for a verse you're creating one phrase, one one uh, idea, one theme, and then the chorus is another related theme, and you're alternating between those. Then you create a middle eight that has a build-up, and then you finish on a big crescendo. That's an easy little structure that you that works, that we know works, because so many songs are built like that. The, the other thing you can do is take your audience on a journey. You know, if it's an emotional solo, you need to create an emotional mindset, you know? So if you can... For example, you can imagine the death of a loved one and how you're holding it together right at the start of the solo and you're trying to keep everything as normal as possible, but slowly let yourself go, slowly let the, the grief fall out of you as the solo, solo builds into a crescendo at the end. And that's a really powerful way of doing it. If, if you don't want to get so emotional about it, the other one that's worked really well for me as well is the idea of a roller coaster. The idea of getting on the roller coaster, that, that initial climb, that initial, you know, wait for, for the top part and the top where you barely move at all and you're just gliding and then you suddenly shoot off again. That, that as a concept is something that I've used successfully as well. So, so the idea here is to create a story and use that story to, to drive the direction that you take the solo in. And what you need to do here as well is to think about intensity. Think about the intensity of the phrasing and how you can build and change that intensity. So for example you can build intensity by moving up through the different registers. You can build intensity by changing the frequency of the notes that you're playing. Changing the spacing between the phrases will, will build intensity. You can do it by adding more dissonance, building, building the more complexity, harmonic complexity as, you, as you're moving on. Or, or introducing, you know, a very classic technique is to start with a, a quiet, undistorted guitar and slowly add the distortion as you're building that intensity up. So there's a plenty of different ways, plenty of different ideas that you can use. And also it's worth thinking about musical gestures as well when you're building this up. That's a whole subject that I've talked about elsewhere, where when you're playing a solo, don't just think about the notes that you play, think about the sounds that you can create. Think about the ideas that you can inject into your playing, not just thinking about the solo melodically. So, as I say, I thought I'd give you some homework this week, which is a listening exercise. And this is actually how I learn most solos, or how I get most out of listening to other guitarists. I very rarely learn a solo note for note. It's much more about understanding the intent and the approach and the phrasing of the guitarist, that's much more important to me than the individual notes that they play. So, so what I thought I'd do is get you to listen to a solo by Derek Trucks. There's a, the, there's a 
solo from Midnight in Harlem and I'll put a link to it in the YouTube description and up there as well just so you can hear it yourself. And what I recommend you do is to listen to this multiple times and listen to it from a number of different points of view. First point of view really is that story arc. What's he doing? How, what's the, how is he managing the intensity through the solo and how is he controlling that? What are the factors that is varying in order to build that intensity right near the end? You know, is it in terms of pitch? Is it in terms of distortion? Is it in terms of the musical gestures? Is it in terms of the spaces between the notes? How is he using that? And then also listen to it from the point of view of uh, verbal communication. Like I say, is he singing this to you? Is he connecting with you on, at that level? Can you hear the musical phrases in there? What's he actually saying? If you, if you had to imagine him saying something, what's the emotion that is conveying in each one of those phrases? See if you can work out what's going on there. Then from a musical level, listen, see if you can hear individual licks and ideas, things that he's developing through the solo, things that he's returning to through the solo as well and see if you can understand how he's doing that, how he's using, bringing back earlier ideas later on in the solo. And then finally, look for musical gestures in here as well. So, like I say, at the start of this solo, he's playing relatively quietly. There's a lot of space between the notes that he's playing. And then listen to how he's starting to introduce more noise, how he's hitting the strings just to create that make make some noise and using that to punctuate the solo instead of silence, for example. So it's, it's well worth doing this, it's well worth listening to this three or four or five times and seeing what you can pull out of it. So anyway, I hope that's been useful for you. I hope that's helped to, to answer your question. Um, this is something, this is an ongoing journey that we all take. We're all trying to improve our, our, the way we communicate with our audience. We're all trying to improve the way we use improve our musical gestures and our phrase construction. Um, but these are some of the approaches that I've found worked really well for me. So hopefully that's been useful for you. I'll chat next time. Goodbye.